In this lecture, we'll review chapters three and four of Warner and Simone. Keep in mind, there's a lot of material in these two chapters, and there's 193 accompanying slides in this lecture. We would be here till midnight if we had to cover every one of them. So I will be going quickly, giving some highlights, some big picture overviews, some points which I feel are more salient for our course, and maybe some observations and examples along the way. So hang on to your hats. Here we go. Now, the first chapter, well, chapter three discusses the topic of learning. And essentially this chapter goes over some of the more uh, notable, relevant, uh, well-researched theories about learning uh, from the past uh, 50 to, to uh, 50 years or so. Some, some pretty standard approaches that have been around for a long time. And then some of the newer approaches, which have to do with cognition, uh, behavior mod, things like that. So essentially what you're getting in this chapter is a very good uh, and dense overview of learning theory. And so there's a lot of people in educational circles uh, who have studied uh, how people learn. And so understanding the foundations of human learning is an important critical task for human resources development, right? Because at its core, HRD is about helping people learn uh, new behaviors, new job roles, new assignments, uh, new skills in a job context. So as HRD professionals, people who under, want to understand the field, you need to understand a little bit something about, uh, about learning and learning psychology and some of the theories that help us understand how people learn, uh, the impediments to learning, uh, how we make learning more or less conducive, uh, the individual differences and the things that people bring to the table, uh, the environment, all the different variables that are going to impact the way in which people learn. So uh, a basic definition here of learning is a relatively permanent change in behavior, cognition, or affect that occurs as a result of one's interaction with the environment. Uh, the focus of learning is on change. Uh, it has to be long lasting. If it's something you learn and then 10 minutes later you don't remember it anymore, uh, that's not really learning. It entered your mind and entered out the back door somehow. It has to do with behaviors, Cognitions and affect. Now, affect is kind of a fancy psychological term, basically for emotions, feelings, uh, attitudes, some of those less tangible kinds of things that human beings uh, do. Uh, so again, we're going to start going a little quickly through these slides here. I will stop where I feel it needs a little more explanation here. Um, some of these are good. Some of these principles here, um, I like the law of effect. Um, a behavior followed by a pleasurable consequence is likely to be repeated, right? So if you're trying to teach some, somebody something, uh, it has to be connected with something positive, eh? something that they need. It's going to help them accomplish a goal. It's going to help them learn. It's going to help them get promoted, advance, learn new skills, do their job more efficiently, etc. And then practice. Uh, repetition strengths, strengthens association, right? So we're trying to associate ideas in their minds, and the more we practice, uh, it, it strengthens that association. Uh, Gestalt, eh, it's not too effective for HRD, but it's an interesting concept from the Germans back, back in the day. Uh, some ideas from instructional psychology here, four components of any learning task is to describe the goal, analyze the state of the learner, identify conditions which allow the learner to achieve competence, and assess and monitor. Now this is actually pretty foundational because as we go through the rest of these ideas, you're going to see a lot of these kind of repeated in various ways, right? So this is sort of a foundational uh, thought really in education is that you describe the goal, you determine where the person is, uh, you identify conditions, and here they talk about instructional techniques, pr procedures, materials, and then you assess. So you think about any class that you've ever taken, you've gotten what? A syllabus, 
which has the objectives. You go through lectures, you read books, that's your material. And then they assess at the end, right? Through tests, through projects, things you write, your reflections. So this is this kind of little three-part uh, approach here to instruction is, uh, is still with us. And this is still very foundational to a lot of uh, instruction. There's more to it, obviously, in a uh, organizational context. But at its core, this is how you can break down how we think about how people learn is by coming up with things that need to be learned, providing the content, and then assessing how well they have learned them. If you remember those three things, uh, it really helps you break down the educational process. And as an educator myself, not just an instructor, but as a, a dean, I rely on that model all the time. And it's something that's it's very, it's very relevant for those of us who uh, do education for profession. We're going to skip some of this cognitive psychology stuff. It's good, but it's dense. You're really going to have to read through the chapters here to really uh, get a handle on it. Uh, an important factor to consider is trainee characteristics. So what does that mean? Well, not every student or employee, as they're called in organization, uh, has the same level of trainability, right? So people are motivated different. And if you recall from last week, we talked about motivation. If somebody does not see the value or importance, or if they've got a, uh, you know, a, an issue or a problem with you or the management or the company or the trainer, uh, or just the topic itself, maybe they feel like they do their job good enough and this whole training initiative, what you're trying to teach them is irrelevant. Uh, they're going to be unmotivated. So task number one, right, is connecting uh, what we're trying to do to motivate uh, individuals to want to engage in the various learning activities. And of course, ability. And there's lots of different abilities, cognitive abilities, intelligence, uh, you know, whatever somebody brings to the table that's going to help them learn. Uh, you know, some people have ADD. It's harder for them to learn, right? So there's a lot of factors, individual factors, and in people's abilities to actually learn. And the perception of the work environment. So what is the environment like in which they're learning? Is it conducive to learning? Uh, we're going to skip over this. Uh, transfer training is an important idea. This basically means if, if, is something learned in a training context, can they transfer it to a real world context? And we're going to see later on that, you know, learning in context and situation, on the job training, uh, learning through experience, etc., are powerful because uh, the transfer happens almost immediately, right? So a trainer or a coach or a mentor is there along the way, but they can immediately see the relevance. So as opposed to being in sort of an artificial classroom environment or a lecture hall or, or a boardroom, right, where you have a trainer who's trying to explain concepts and even if it's interesting and engaging, even if there's, you know, case studies, it brings it out, that doesn't necessarily make it transferable, Lord. So, so the idea here is that people can transfer ideas, not just from the classroom to the work context, but from one situation to another. And that's why as graduate level students, we're trying to give you a lot of concepts, right? Because concepts are transferable. Specific ideas, you know, uh, are not quite as transferable. As, as you understand things from a conceptual level, what's behind uh, an action or activity behavior, you can transfer that, right? So that's where our minds engage and we analyze and say, oh, this helps me understand this and we can also apply this over here as well. Okay, so we talked a little bit about trainee characteristics. Uh, trainability would be this little formula here, motiv motivation, ability, and perceptions of a work environment. Uh, Pre-training motivation, right? How do we get people engaged, excited, interested in the training in the first place? Uh, personality and attitudes have something to do with one's ability uh, to engage in training, right? Uh, traits for training, locus of control, that's a good one. This is whether or not people feel that they have control over the environment or their environment has control over them. Uh, you might say a fatalistic attitude, right? Somebody who's fatalistic has what's called an external locus of control. 
they don't feel like it makes much difference what they do. So somebody with a strong external locus of control doesn't really think training is going to be that valuable. But internal locus control, uh, say, yeah, it's up to me to learn and to grow and to change and to, you know, knock it out of the park, right? So you want strong locus of control people. People with a high need for achievement are probably going to be more open and uh, open to training and growth, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Training design. I'm going to skip some of this here. Overlearning. Ah, this is a good one, right? Why do we, you know, why do us teachers force you students to learn so dang much when at the end of the day you're probably not going to remember or use much of it? Well, it's called overlearning. And the more you learn, the more it will spill into your thinking and practice and activities and behavior. Uh, out in, in, in the world. So when you train, you give people, you know, you, you shoot them with fire hose and you hope that they can come back with a, you know, a little pea shooter uh, ability at the end of the day to, uh, to demonstrate that they've learned something. I, I'm, I'm exaggerating just a little bit, but this idea here is that uh, it's okay to overlearn. It's okay to learn more than you think you know, uh, because it will come back. It'll help you perform uh, in situations. Feedback is critical, right? Why do you want to get your papers back? Why do you want to look at what the professor thought about your writing, et cetera, et cetera? We need feedback and uh, very important. So when you're training folks, when you're teaching, you need to give feedback. Uh, instant feedback is really optimal. You've taken tests before where as soon as you answer a question, it'll tell you whether it's right or wrong. And that's helpful, right? You immediately learn what you didn't know. Skipping through a lot of this stuff here. Again, this is kind of dense learning theory stuff. You really need to read the chapter to, uh, to get a lot of this. This is actually kind of interesting here. Um, support. Now, you could have the most well-designed training protocol uh, in your organization, but there needs to be support in order for it to actually have an impact on people's job performance, right? So supervisory support. So let's just say, you know, Joe goes to a training session, learns all these wonderful ideas, and he gets back to the real world, and his boss says, ah, that's a bunch of hooey. You know, I did that thing once, and uh, it didn't help me at all. And, you know, Joe says, you know, he's kind of disillusioned and says, ah, why did I do that? You know, and he just, he doesn't value what he just learned, right? But if the supervisor is supportive and says, yeah, that's good stuff, help us to grow and to change uh, here by what you're learning, that's motivating, right? So people get that support, the organizational support as well, right? Where there's a climate and culture of continuous learning where people are empowered and encouraged to learn. That's just part of what we do around here. So these are important, right? So if the organization or if the individual managers don't support, encourage, reward training, guess what? It's not gonna be very effective. You're kind of wasting your money uh, to send people to training and to have training in-house efforts if the organization itself isn't supportive. So here are pictures of the proverbial learning curve. It's not just a proverb, it's actual concept here. Some people learn quicker uh, than others. Some people have steeper learning curves, some have slower. You know, identify your learning curve here. Uh, this is really dense here, and it's going to take you some time to wrap your mind. It's going to take you a while to learn this one yourself cognitive resource allocation theory. If anybody learns this, you can explain it to me. Send me an email. I'll be impressed. Okay, and I'm going to camp out a little bit here. This is important to me, and I think it should be important to you, adult learning theory. Uh, why is this important? Because in a work context, you're going to be working primarily with adults. That's right. So a lot of educational theory was grounded in traditional uh, education of children, right? And that's what's called pedagogy. Uh, but andragogy is the term used for thinking about how adults learn. And it's different. Adults learn differently than uh, children do. And most of you are adults and we try to use some more andragogical approaches to education here at APU that we're going to help you engage. 
Um, so some of the you know precepts here are things such as uh, adults are more self-directive. They've already acquired large amounts of knowledge and experience that can be tapped as a resource for learning. They show a greater readiness to learn and they're motivated to learn in order to solve problems or address needs. So when, so when an adult comes to learn, they're typically not doing it, you know, because they have to, right? A kid, you know, think about your average middle schooler or high schooler. They're only there because they have to be there. Their parents make them be there. You've got some advanced kids and maybe, you know, some of you all there were outstanding students and you just loved your English class and your math class. But for the most part, kids are doing it because they have to. Um, to avoid, you know, they want to avoid punishment. So they work hard so they can get out of that thing. But once you're an adult and you get out in the real world and you realize you don't know everything you need to know in order to excel and perform, all of a sudden motivation to learn, it takes on a whole new meaning, right? And so adults can be more self-directed. Plus you have experience. So some of you, maybe you've been working for 10 or 15 years. You come into a class like this and you're like, you can immediately see the importance because you do these things already and you're starting to connect the dots each chapter you read is like you know something that you can connect to what you do or what you've done so it helps make learning easier when you're younger you know imagine teaching this class to a 15 year old or 16 year old like what what do i care about any of this stuff i don't care how people learn i don't care about hrd right so adults can assimilate ideas quicker because they're connecting the dots between new ideas and their previous experience. Uh, these next slides just go through some of the characteristics and the distinctions between uh, pedagogy and andragogy. Uh, some of the commonalities here are things like uh, pedagogy is typically more top-down, it's more structured, it's more rule-oriented, it's more memorization, uh, it's a little rigid, right, rules and laws. Andragogy for adults tends to be a little more flexible, open, interactive, peer-to-peer, -peer, participative, and knowledge sharing, those sorts of things, right? So as we're, for children, it's a little more authority-oriented, formal, low trust. Andragogy tends to be a little more relaxed, trusting, mutually respective, informal, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And hopefully you experience some of these things in, uh, in this class and other classes as you're a graduate student here. Uh, this is a good one here. The motivation for kids is typically, like I mentioned earlier, external rewards and punishment. For adults, your reward is you learn, right? Um, and that's a powerful motivator. People want to learn. They want to grow as human beings and in their jobs. All right, I'm going to have to go quicker here because we've got a lot to cover. Uh, traditional versus non-traditional. This is similar to pedagogy versus, uh, I'm sorry, pedagogy versus andragogy, right? Um, so non-traditional learning, uh, again, is connecting ideas to the real world. Um, I like this one here. Traditional education, especially kids, right, developed a tolerance for bureaucracy, right? Every day somebody's telling them what to do, rules to follow, forms to fill out, lines to wait in, you know, non-traditional older students, they have a low tolerance for that, right? They want to participate, they're, uh, they're, they want to be, they want to be treated as an individual, right? Not as just a, another, uh, another kid. Uh, Kolb's learning styles, it's kind of a classic, it's been around for a long time here. Perhaps you're familiar with learning styles. Uh, this is a good one to kind of get under your belt. For me, the main takeaway on this one is that not everybody learns the same, right? So some people learn through uh, experimentation, some people learn by uh, doing, some people learn by reading, some people learn by touching. Um, hearing, seeing, right? There's all these different ways, sensory input and ways of thinking, right? So when you're developing training, you have to be aware that not everybody is going to respond to the same thing. Now, I tend to gravitate towards, you know, ideas and theories. And so that's why it's important to me. And I think as graduate students, you have to become comfortable with that 
way of thinking as well. But, you know, in your job situation, especially for frontline workers, they're not as concerned with abstract concepts. They want concrete ways to actually improve what they do. So you have to adapt. But you're going to have some, you know, some of the more abstract people in front lines as well. They're going to want to know why, right? So some people don't care why. They just want to know how. So you have to be ready to deal with and instruct people who have different learning styles and different needs uh, for knowledge acquisition. So, you know, the next few slides and pages go through some of these different kinds of models. So concrete, abstract, uh, reflective, active experimentation, right? So this is important. This is a very, this is a standard one. You probably learned this one pretty good here. It's important. There's inventories to help one determine what their learning style is. Different learning strategies here, right? Uh, rehearsal strategy, repeating items a lot, right? This is good if you're like an athlete or a musician. You just do the same thing over and over again. I'm a musician. I practice scales, arpeggios, runs, just over and over again, right? Until you can do them without even thinking. Same thing I know for athletes and other people. Um, I think also people in high stress jobs or jobs which request, uh, which require quick reaction time, I think about law enforcement, they do the same things over and over again. So when the stress comes on and kicks on, uh, they don't even have to think about it. They just know what the appropriate response is because when you get in a stressful situation, um, you you know your your brain goes into a different mode. And so, actually, you know they say a lot of performance has to do with sort of you you get in the zone, you you go with it. You're not thinking anymore. Now, obviously, there's creativity and reaction and interaction with others. Uh, think about jazz music versus classical music, right? Jazz musicians interact a lot with the other musicians and the tempo and the feel and the mood, you know, classical musicians, man, you got your eye on that score and you got your eye on that conductor and you follow the script. So, uh, I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> Anyhow, I just thought you'd want a little tidbit on musical. Oh, I was talking about rehearsal. That's right. So people rehearse differently, uh, because they, they, they perform differently as well. All right, I'm going to move on here. Expert and sexual. Okay, so I was talking about this a little bit. Expert performance. There's been a lot done on this. Uh, it seems like uh, Malcolm Gladwell a few years ago really kind of got everybody excited about this with his uh, his theory that uh, you know you become an hour when you've done something for uh, ten thousand. You become an expert after you've done something for ten thousand hours, right? If you've done something for ten thousand hours, you're probably an expert. So. You know, I've done the math on that. If you practice, for example, let's say you want to become an expert uh, violinist. If you practice for one hour a day, you will be an expert after 27 years. <laughs> so you better get started, people. Um, so that's why, you know, a lot of people who are expert in their early adulthood, in their 20s, they've already practiced thousands and thousands of hours, right? So you practice four hours a day, every day a week. Now, by the time you're 25 or 30, you are an expert. And so that's why some people, you know, perform with, you know, world-class symphonies and other guys are busking on the street corner, right? So, so practice to become an expert. Now, how does this apply in work context? Uh, we're not trying, we don't have time to give people 10,000 hours, right? So Malcolm Gladwell's idea there, it's obviously, it's an ideal. It's reflecting on people with high expertise in a particular field. Um, but the point here is that consistent uh, repetition, consistent practice, uh, high levels of motivation will lead to expertise in any area. So here's some of the data here on uh, practice, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that I was referring to. Uh, Gagne. All right, so we're flying through some of this stuff here. Um, basically talks about different cognitive strategies, ways that people learn, ways of teaching, um, all good stuff. All right, and that leads us to 
assessing of HRD needs. So if you need to take a break, hit pause right now, and then come back in just a minute. So when endeavoring to develop an HRD program, formal, informal, the first thing we need to do is assess. So if you recall back from chapter one, assessment is the first step, followed by uh, implementation, um, and then uh, evaluation, right? So the first thing we need to do is assess the needs. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the different things that need to be assessed uh, before moving forward with developing the actual training. So one of the big deals in HRD is to determine how training is going to help you solve real world problems, real issues in your organization. So it's a little bit different. You guys are in a program now, you're in a graduate program, you're kind of learning general skills to help you generally in a general future, right? But HRD initiatives are real specific and focused and they're tied to organizational strategy and organizational objectives, right? So it's okay to do general kinds of training like you know time management and organization and leadership you know these are going to help folks but typically you know when people when organizations are going to spend big money on important initiatives they're going to hire you to be their hrd director uh, they want to see an, a return on investment and so the best way to guarantee return on investment is to make sure that training is focused on target and meets a real world organization need that's going to help uh, that's going to help the organization achieve new goals right so maybe it's a change initiative maybe it's a new strategy maybe it's a new market maybe it's a new product maybe it's a new process right process improvement streamlining you know becoming more customer focused, service centered, uh, implementing a new technology. I mean, there's just a, a myriad of ways organizations change and evolve over the years. So a, a training uh, initiative needs to assess the needs that are targeted. They're gonna help the organization kind of move into that new uh, thing that they're doing, right? So it can improve HRD by solving current problems. Right. So let's just say, for example, all of a sudden you're getting a lot of complaints from customers about a specific thing. Yeah, we need to train our people to deal with that or preventing anticipated problems, anticipated problems, such as a shortage of skilled technicians, uh, including as participants, those individuals and units that can benefit the most. Right. So you got to tie the training into specific kinds of things. So that's what makes HRD different than just going to school, you know, going, just getting an education. Uh, kind of getting a broad skill set. It's a very focused, targeted, specific training for a specific issue going on in the organization. So here it is again. And again, you guys need to know this one. This is critical right here. These four steps, this is going to come back. And this is really, you know, the heart of a good chunk of the class for the next few weeks here is the training in HRD process model, which starts with needs assessment, design, implementation, and evaluation, right? So figure what you need to do, what are the goals, who needs it, how are we gonna do it, uh, design, what is the training gonna look like, uh, implement it, actually do the training, and then evaluate. And not just evaluate the effectiveness of the training, but evaluate how much more productive or effective, how was the need of the organization actually met, right? So you have to have metrics which can connect the outcomes of the training with the organizational goal that you're trying to, uh, you're trying to approve. So that's where you convince, you know, stakeholders, i.e. executives, board members, that the money spent on HRD initiatives is money well spent. So you can, when you can connect the dots empirically with some data, with some research that shows, hey, we had our management team, we had our frontline team go through this training. We assessed before they went into the training this problem. We, we trained to solve the problem, to address the need, and then we implemented it and we reassessed, say six months or nine months or a year later, uh, the problem and it significantly went away. And so you can make the argument now um, that the training was instrumental in helping that particular need, right? So evaluation piece is big, it's really big. 
So here's a model that sort of shows that. So, 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 so for this lecture right here, we're just talking about this first column, assessing the needs. Later on in the class, you're going to go through the other stages here, design, implementation, evaluation. Right now, we're just focused on the needs assessment. So needs assessment is a process by which an organization's HRD needs are identified and, identified and articulated. Now, by the way, this term needs assessment isn't unique to HRD. A lot of fields use this. Uh, I think of, for example, in nonprofit work, right? What's a needs assessment of a community? Uh, does a com community need some kind of service or program? Uh, you know, literacy program, and there's a lot of ways that a nonprof can assess the needs of a community. But in this context, for this class, we're using needs assessment to determine what are the training needs, uh, what are the job needs, what are the job characteristics, and all those sorts of things. So it's the starting point of the HRD and training process. So H, uh, assessment can identify organizational goals and its effectiveness in reaching the goals, discrepancies between employee skills and the skills required. And this is important here. And this is what, might, what you might call popularly the skills gap, right? So these are the skills that people need. That this is the skills our organization needs. We've assessed our people where they are, and guess what? They don't have those skills. So that little thing right there is what you call the gap. So you train in order to fill that gap. Uh, discrepancies between current skills and the skills needed in the future and the conditions under which HRD activity will occur. Uh, why they are sometimes not conducted, you know, they're difficult, right? So we're talking about this isn't an easy thing to do. It can be timely, time produced, time, uh, time consuming, um, Often we have a bias for action, right? So you come in and say, well, we need to assess what the needs are. And, you know, Joe Activator says, no, nah, we just need to hire McKinsey and have them come in here and train our people. They'll know what to do. Well, you know, yeah, sometimes calling expensive consultants works, but, um, and they're glad to take your money from you. But a thoughtful HRD program and thoughtful HRD director will, you know, insist that we assess for specific training needs and we don't just hire a one-size-fits-all generalist uh, to come in and solve a problem that we don't really have. Uh, training need, deficiency between what's expected and what occurs, etc., etc. All right, so we're going to kind of move a little bit quicker here. We've got a lot of ground to cover. All right, this talks about some traps that you can fall into. For example, just following on individual performances, uh, start with a training needs assessment. Uh, you know, why you say, wait a minute, we just say we need a needs assessment. Well, there is no need for a needs assessment if you already know the training is the answer. Uh, just sending out questionnaires, right? So this kind of addresses some of the, you know, dichotomous problems that we fall into. We either do this or we do that. Uh, different le levels of needs analysis, right? So at the strategic organizational, what are the big picture? What's going on? How is our strategy changing? Uh, what are the organizational goals, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, the task level analysis, what must be done to perform the task, and the person analysis. Okay, so now we're going to sort of cover some of these things and we're going to do so quickly. So the strategic organizational analysis, as I just said, includes things like the organizational goals, resources, climate, constraints, right? So things have changed. The organization's goals have changed. The climate outside, the environment has changed. Uh, we need to assess that change and how our people need to change uh, and their competencies and skills need to change to meet those. Uh, Okay, so here's some specifics here, uh, core competencies. Uh, okay, now this is a good one here, organizational culture and climate. Now, I like this because I'm an organizational behavior guy, but really you know, this is so foundational to ask things like, is our culture conducive to training? You can, again, you know, maybe a board member or an executive says, yeah, we need a HRD director, we need some HRD director uh, uh, initiatives. And they hire you, you know, you're freshly minted MBM from Mizzou Pacific, and you get in there and you're all excited because you took my class. 
and you find out that nobody cares about training, right? And you like, feel like you're hitting your head against the wall because they don't have a conducive culture and climate, right? So this is difficult. So, you know, I warn you, you know, we, unless you can make the change in the culture, it's, you, you've got to have an uphill climb here in trying to actually be a successful HRD uh, professional. You want to come into a culture and climate where they value it, where they really see that moving into the future, that meeting their strategic goals and aspirations, and, you know, even just their commitment to their people, that it's really tied into training. Um, this section talks about how you analyze strategic organizational analysis, you know, what data do you need, right? So there's a lot of different data you're going to need to, uh, to gather in order to determine what some of those strategic needs are. Oh, exit interviews. <laughs> That's a good one. You'll learn a lot from those. Okay, now, first level of analysis is organizational, right? Second is a task. So task analysis or operations analysis is a systematic collection of data about a specific job or group of jobs to determine what an employee should be taught to achieve optimal performance, okay? So basically, what does somebody need to do in order to do their job effectively or to do the new you know, job or rollout, whatever the organization's got going on? Uh, KSOs, this is a pretty foundational concept here too. You should probably remember this, knowledge, skills, and abilities, and other characteristics, right? So what's the knowledge one needs? What are the skills? What are the abilities? Read your chapter. It will break down what those three things are there for you. So the steps in task analysis uh, Develop an overall job description, identify the task, describe the KSO, KSAOs, identify areas that can benefit, prioritize. Now, hope you're paying attention because we actually have an exercise at the end of this week where you are going to do a task analysis for a job that you are familiar with, right? So pay particular attention to this section uh, and this part of the uh, textbook because you're going to need to actually do an exercise on task analysis. Oops. All right, so job description, that's always a good place to start. Uh, analysis, again, a systematic study to look at the components of the job, task, working conditions, etc. Task identification focuses on the behavior performed within the job. And okay, so how do we determine what, how, what are some sources for understanding what the, the needs are, the task needs are? So this describes some of these things. We just describe these briefly here, but things like job descriptions, uh, job specification, task analysis, performance standards, uh, perform the job, uh, observe job work sampling, uh, review the literature, right? So what does the research out there in your particular field say about, you know, task analysis here? Uh, ask questions about the job of people who do it, supervisors, management, training committees or conferences, uh, analysis of operating problems, downtime waste, etc. Task identification focuses on the behaviors performed within the job. Here are some methods for identifying task identification. Time sampling. Now, this one, you know, maybe because I'm more of a leadership development guy, but this one kind of irks me a little bit, you know, to think that we observe and watch people and note the nature and frequency of activities. Now, again, this is probably for your frontline kinds of people, right? You're not doing this for your, your management, your skilled people, right? Because their jobs are more complex and nuanced. You're not going to be able to observe everything they do. Uh, this is really for people that kind of do repetitive, routine tasks. I think of things like call centers. I think of things like, uh, you know, food workers and, you know, things where it's fairly automated, repetitive. 
you can observe how long it takes them to do a particular task, right? So you're trying to streamline things. It also kind of reminds me of scientific management, which was one of the very first approaches to management back in the day, right? So we've come a long way. People are not just cogs and machines. So if you approach people as if, you know, they're simply there to maximize profit and productivity, uh, you know, you're, you're not off to a good footing. So use this one with caution, in my opinion. Critical incident technique, it's a very good one. Okay, I'm gonna move quickly here. All right, and then the last phase is person analysis, right? So we looked at the organizational analysis, we've looked at the task analysis, and now we have to ask questions about the people. Directed at determining the training needs of the individual employee, focuses typically on how well each employee is performing a key job or task. So similar to before, we have to collect some data to figure out what the needs assessment for people here are. And there's a lot of good, uh, lot of good data here in this chapter on that. Now, performance appraisal is probably one of the most common ways that we determine how people do in their jobs, right? Uh, performance appraisal is not what it used to be. Uh, a lot of forward-thinking organizations are changing their approach to performance appraisal, but it's still with us. And so as an HRD professional, obviously, you need to be aware of both the historic and emerging trends in performance appraisals. Uh, 360 degree performance appraisal is becoming more common now. We do not assess a, a person's performance just by what their supervisor says, right? But you ask their peers and you ask people who work under them. Uh, you might even ask, you know, end users, customers, right? To see how well people are doing. So this is becoming more common to get a full range view and perspective of how well people are performing their jobs. And then it ends here with uh, prioritizing uh, HRD needs, right? It's figuring out what's most important, right? So if you do all these analysis, you're probably going to come up with 10 things that are, you know, really important that need to be done. How do you determine which efforts to do first? How do you prioritize them? How do you get the support, the buy-in of people to move forward? So the thought here is you get a committee of folks, right? Broad swath, cross-section of the organization, who meet and review the needs assessment and offer advice on HRD offerings. And so if you are the HRD director, you'll probably chair or at least be a key member of a committee like this. And there's some debate on this model here. And that is it. So I hope this was instructive. I know we had a lot of ground to cover here, but uh, Try to do what I can in the time we had. So blessings to y'all. We'll see you online.